Welcome to the Soul Seeker Podcast. I'm your host, Sam Kabert, and this year marks the fifth birthday of the Soul Seeker Podcast. I started this pod back in 2019 when I was taking my first steps on the path of remembering. And at the time, the tagline for the show was a journey of self discovery. A year later, it became a journey of remembering. Yet, what I know now is back then I was still seeking. And what I've come to know now is that it's the journey of seeking that brings us the silent, slow stillness of acceptance. And therein lies our own innate wisdom. It's my mission now to eradicate the glorification of hustle culture, as it was my drive in entrepreneurship that led to a greater whole. And that's because I was outsourcing my sovereignty rather than looking within. So let this be your invitation to take a deep breath in and remember that at any time we can shift our thoughts and our feelings to create the outer world in which we wish to live. Soul Seekers, it's time to grow. Let's go. All right. Welcome, welcome. We're going to get deep in this one. So first things first. I'd like to just invite us all to slow down and to connect with our breath. And for the next few minutes here, I'm just going to invite you that if you're someone that likes to go on bike rides or clean or do yard work or do stuff while you listen to a podcast, at least just for these next few minutes, just take the time for yourself to sit down and to breathe with me. Because like I said, we're getting deep in this one. The Soul Seeker podcast is all about getting deep. And I would hope that you feel that in all of the other episodes. Yet for this specific episode about 5-MeO-DMT, poof all various, the God molecule, I would like to just really tap into my heart and be present with you guys. And this grounding practice is honestly as much as it is for me as it is for you. A lot of times when I do these podcasts, I'll meditate or do some breath work beforehand, but I I really like to be able to do it with you as well because it helps us to get on the same frequency. So with that, if you are doing anything that is keeping you from being fully present, because this is such a deep and profound and serious too topic, I would just invite you to hit pause and then come back to this when you can give it your full presence. So with that, let's all go ahead and find a comfortable seat. And as you land in your seat, just starting to deepen the breath. Notice your feet on the floor. Noticing your palms on your lap. And just straightening out your spine. If you find that you're leaning forward or back, just lifting your shoulders up, placing those shoulders back down, and we'll begin to connect the breath with the movement. So we'll roll out the neck, inhaling as the neck comes back, and exhaling as the neck comes forward. Just a few more like that. Switching directions, inhaling as the neck comes forward, and exhaling as the neck comes back. Making your way back to neutral, finding an inhale through the nose and lifting those shoulder blades up, exhaling the shoulder blades back down. Just noticing how you feel. Letting yourself sit with any emotions, any energies, any thoughts coming through. We'll all find an inhale together, inhaling through the nose as you let the belly expand and bring that breath all the way up to the chest, pausing at the top, sipping a bit more air, hold. And through the mouth, dropping the shoulders, belly to spine, exhale. Through the nose, inhaling up. 
Sipping in a bit more at the top. Sip in a bit more. Hold the breath. And through the mouth, exhale. Slowly inhaling all the way up. Sip in a bit more at the top. Sip in a bit more. Swallow. Roll back the eyes. Hold the breath. And audible sigh, let it go. Letting your breath return to its natural state and rhythm. And when you're ready, just flickering your eyes back open. Simple, simple. Nothing too intense, nothing crazy. Just grounding together here. So you're free to do whatever you'd like now. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, though, I invite you to go about however feels best to you, whether you're listening to this podcast in nature, if you're sitting in your house and just sitting down with a pen and paper ready to take notes, or if you're doing the dishes, folding laundry, walking your dog on a bike ride, on a car ride, whatever it is, just do your thing. Welcome. If we don't know each other, my name is Sam Kabert, and I am the host of this podcast called Soul Seeker. And I started this podcast in, I don't remember, it was like summer or fall of 2019. So depending on when you're listening to it, it's that old. Uh, for those of you that are listening to it when it's gone live in May of 2024, we are celebrating the five-year anniversary, and I'm very, very proud and humbled and surprised that we're here because honestly i started this podcast after sitting with ayahuasca for the first time and back in 2019 if i think back uh, kind of time traveling back then i had done maybe four or five podcasts at that point in time and i had a couple that reached uh, 100 episodes and even still though those podcasts lasted like maybe a year or two or maybe three tops and the only one I've ever done since 2019 is Soul Seeker. And one of the things that plant and earth medicines have helped me so much with is focus. Because very much as a serial entrepreneur, I, I, I experienced that shiny object syndrome. And it's like kind of bouncing from one thing to the next. And that's really one of the things that has helped me so much is in the integration of working with this, these medicines. So that said, this specific episode is about 5MBO DMT Bufo Alvarius Toad. I have very extensive experience with this medicine in the past four years. I've helped people prepare and integrate their Bufo ceremonies. When I say I've helped people, it's well over 500 people. I've been involved in law ceremonies, let's just put it that way, and helped people prepare, integrate. And I'm very well versed with my own journeys of this medicine. Now, when I personally came across Bufo, I was about a year, maybe two years into my spiritual journey after having sat with ayahuasca for the first time. So for me, I like to say it kind of jokingly and also lovingly and affectionately, like ayahuasca is my first love, you know, because that was really the medicine that helped me to experience that spiritual awakening, which I do want to say that for most people, when we are working with plant and earth medicines, we might have like a spiritual awakening experience. And really it's an unfold, it's an unfolding. Like we will get this profound realization from working with the medicines, or maybe for you, it's a spontaneous like Kundalini awakening or something through meditation or anything, right? But for most of us, especially in the West, we're not living in an ongoing state of awakening, right? And some people are chasing, quote unquote, enlightenment. For me, the goal is not enlightenment. I'm not trying to be an enlightened being here on earth. I'm simply just trying to be more in touch with my inner world so I can be more consciously aware of my thoughts and feelings to improve my mental and emotional well-being. I like this concept that I've heard other speakers talk about. I think her name is Maya Rachuri. I forget her name exactly, but I recently saw her TED talk. 
at the time of this recording and she talks about mental fitness and it was such a great inspirational ted talk about mental fitness like hey we we talk about physical fitness so much but why aren't we talking about mental fitness and really that's that is what i've been practicing the past five years or so in the integration is my mental and emotional fitness so i just love that term mental fitness so much and more than anything yes i'll get into what bufo is all about and how to prepare uh, and what the experience will look like but the thing that i want you to know more than anything else is the integration now with plant and earth medicines if you're not familiar with these terms or you haven't sat with uh, a medicine ceremony at all i'm going to do my best to make this accessible to everyone so some of you listening might be very well experienced either with the toad and you're just curious about this or other medicines and some of you may have no experience with medicine ceremonies at all so for that reason i'm just going to try to make the language that i'm using very very accessible and what i like to think of a plant and or earth medicine ceremony as is intentional use with psychedelics psychedelic therapy right these are psychedelics that I'm referring to. Specifically in this podcast, we'll be talking about Bufo. Know that there's psychoactive ceremonies that aren't necessarily psychedelic. Psychoactive refers to like basically the brain, lighting up the brain. And that's what this term psychoactive, it doesn't necessarily mean it has hallucinogenic effects and therefore is not psychedelic. An example of that, something that is psychoactive would be caffeine. So if you drink coffee, that is a psychoactive. And the reason why I bring this up is because when we use words like plant and earth ceremonies, something like a cacao ceremony, which is not psychedelic, it is psychoactive, does it require, maybe not require, but you can use it in a ceremonial setting. Or also the frog medicine that is combo or cambo. It's not psychedelic, but is psychoactive, right? So I basically say all that to say that when I'm thinking of these quote unquote ceremonies, I'm thinking about deep transformational healing. This isn't like going on a hike with your friend with some mushrooms, right? I think a lot of people can relate to that either in their youth or even now and going outdoors in nature and experimenting with psychedelics. I personally don't consider that quote unquote psychedelic therapy. I, I consider that recreational use with psychedelics and I have no judgment towards that. I think it's just a different intention is all. And psychedelic therapy to me, when I think of this term, I'm thinking of something a little bit more professional, like maybe MDMA therapy or ketamine therapy where you're working with inside like potentially an office building, you know, and you're working with maybe a therapist or something like that. And to me, it doesn't have like the same sort of spiritual intention as a ceremony, right? Just imagine you're going to see your therapist and you're going into like, I don't even know what those are called. And they're almost like apartment complex uh, type office buildings. They're not obviously not strip malls, but whatever. And we all know what where a therapist's office may be. And of course, there's a lot of different variations of buildings and offices. I've just had multiple experiences working with therapists where it's kind of like those office buildings where they're kind of like apartment style, if you will. Anyways, when you get to see your therapist, you know, there's couch, chair, whatever. Now, when it's psychedelic therapy, it might be in a setting like that versus when you're working with plant and earth medicines, this ceremony is typically going to be very, very different. A lot of times the facilitators will wear white, will be working with sage and Palo Santo will be calling in angels and use, utilizing prayer will be um, uh, maybe sometimes outdoors, maybe in someone's home. It could be uh, in a what's called maloka kind of similar to a yurt you can think of it as a tent and it has very much a different vibe right than 
and going to office buildings. So that's kind of, for me personally, how I delineate the differences between recreational use with psychedelics, psychedelic therapy, and plant and earth medicines. Now, in my experience in working with the toad, this is an earth medicine ceremony. And I use the word or the terminology earth medicine because the molecule 5-MeO-DMT is coming from a toad. It's not necessarily plant medicine. It's an earth medicine for that reason, right? So a little bit of history about Bufo. And this is a, from my training, my knowledge, and, you know, understand that I know what I know, and I don't think I know everything, right? And if someone is ever talking to me like they know everything and they're the almighty wisdom, that's typically personally when I'm going to kind of do like an about face and be like, yeah, I'm going to go the other way. So know that if I get anything wrong, I'm human, right? Doing my best here. So the toad medicine is a newer medicine. It doesn't have the history of ayahuasca. It hasn't been around for thousands of years. It's uh, much more recent than that. The toad itself is called the Bufo alvarius toad. It has other names as well. Sonoran desert toad, Colorado river toad, and more names than that. Most commonly, when you hear someone talk about the toad medicine or 5-MeO, they're gonna to say toad medicine, 5-MeO, 5-MeO-DMT, 5 or Bufo. That is what you will most commonly hear it referred to as. Now, when someone says DMT, please understand that DMT doesn't necessarily mean that they are referring to 5-MeO-DMT. Specifically, as a longtime Joe Rogan listener myself, I know that the majority of the time Joe is talking about DMT, he is referring to an NDMT, which is Nancy Nancy DMT, very different than 5-MeO DMT. So realize that when you're in conversation with someone or you're listening to a podcast or you're reading whatever, if it is just referred to as just those three letters, DMT, most commonly, that's referred to an NDMT as opposed to 5-MeO DMT. It's a very different experience. We are going to go deep in the experience of 5-MeO, Bufo, Toad Medicine. I'll use those terminologies interchangeably. But one thing I do want to just cover right now while we're on this subject is that an NDMT or just simply DMT is... From my experience, from what I've read, heard, listened to, and ex experienced with friends' stories as well, it doesn't typically have the ceremony approach to it. It doesn't typically have the same healing properties or healing experience, I should say, as 5-MeO. And it's a very visual experience. This is where you may have heard of seeing machine elves or needing to do an inhale three times to get through the portal and go through the tunnel and break through to the other side and see all these entities and beings. Most commonly, from my experience, how I've heard DMT referred to is more of like, uh, like, oh, it was wild, like a crazy trip, you know, things like that. Whereas with 5-MeO, it is typically not visual for people, meaning that you typically won't see like entities, especially machine elves or anything like that. Sometimes people will get visuals and sort of like a sacred geometry or slight kaleidoscope type image. I've seen it kind of as white folding in on itself. Uh, but most commonly with, with 5-MeO, people don't necessarily have visuals. It's more of a felt experience. And it's that feeling of like, you are God experiencing itself in separation. It's that feeling of time doesn't exist. It's that feeling of infinity. It's that feeling that you are creator of your human experience, of this human experience. It's that feeling and gnosis and understanding that, wow, I chose all of these different karmic lessons and soul contracts and conditions and i can choose to be the victor of my own story and not the victim to my circumstances and it's the understanding that this isn't necessarily quote unquote 
ultimate reality. Now, I like to think of Bufo, but really all of these plant and earth medicines as taking the red pill. Or for those of you that saw Barbie, what was in Barbie taking a high heel? I thought that was pretty funny. Shout out to that movie. It was pretty clever. But uh, yeah, more commonly known, the uh, matrix, right? The blue pill or the red pill. Working with ayahuasca, Bufo, even mushrooms, a mushroom ceremony for sure, and pretty much any psychedelic, but especially when it's used uh, intentionally, ceremonially, is taking the red pill. Now, I don't say that to scare you and say, oh, no, you, you can't go back. Once you take the red pill, you can't go back. But I do tell you this to say, this is deep work. This is serious, right? Like, I've heard people in the past say, like, oh, I want to try Bufo or I want to try ayahuasca. And it makes me think of um, that meme that's been floating around the internet for years now of the, I think it's the original king from Game of Thrones. Or is, no, it's the same actor but it, he was in um lord of the rings i don't remember his name but like it's the meme that says one does not simply try and then they plug something in i, I hope you can see that in your mind's eye but basically what i'm saying here is one does not try ayahuasca this isn't like going to the store or baskin robin who's got i haven't been baskin robins in years but baskin robins 31 flavors right or any ice cream shop and be like oh can i get a sample can i try that no we aren't trying bufo we aren't trying ayahuasca this is going all in this is not dipping your toe in the water and that is a very important thing to understand and i'll give you a quick anecdote in 2018 i started to really practice yoga i started to get into transcendental meditation I started to microdose with psilocybin mushrooms. And that's when ayahuasca came into my field. I had a friend starting to tell me about it. he had done it and he was telling me how it worked for him. And it terrified me straight up. I was there's something in me that said, Oh wow. Like I felt it, like, oh, I'm gonna do this thing one day. But it also terrified me, being like, no, I'm good, you know. And he would tell me about ceremonies. I'm like, no. And then at the time, like, my life was pretty good. You know, things were going well. I was uh, I was on my way to building a million dollar company. It was the year before I got named to Silicon Valley's 40 under 40 list. So I was uh, in the height of my career. I was dating a 49ers cheerleader and we were on and off, but we were good at the time. And I was, uh, I was, I was happy in the, uh, the hustle. I was happy in the hustle because I was disconnected from my internal world of my thoughts and feelings. So I knew something was off and that was like that feeling of like, yeah, 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 I'll do that one day. But then I I was happy enough where it was like, yeah, uh, uh, I'm not going to do that now. What happened the next year is I went through a numbing depression and that had to do with a ruptured relationship, the on off relationship I just mentioned, uh, along with achieving these successes and being like, how come... I don't feel different after achieving these successes. For those of you that have seen the movie Soul or for those of you that are familiar with my work, one of my favorite movies is the Pixar movie Soul. Just that, nothing else, four letters joined together to form the word soul. And in this movie, Joe Gardner, he's the main character. He lives his life desperately wanting to be a famous and well-recognized musician. And on the night of his big break, he plays his heart out on the piano. He's in the zone. And the experience was everything that he envisioned, but yet he was unfulfilled. After his big break at this uh, jazz, this jazz club, the camera closes in on him and he says, all my life, I've been waiting for this day. I thought, I thought I'd feel different. And when I saw that movie where this guy was like chasing his dream of being an amazing jazz mu musician, and when he fulfilled that dream, uh, only to feel we can infer as disappointed or let down, it just hit me in my chest and my heart so much because that's what I've been feeling these past few years as I go down the spiritual journey, realizing, oh, wow. As I've sat, sought out after my successes, it's almost like on a subconscious level, I was saying to myself, when I achieve ABC, I will feel XYZ. I was outsourcing my sovereignty in these accomplishments. All I could ever feel worthy of 
was these achievements, the successes and the accomplishments and the dopamine that came with it, which got me to be like a hamster on never ending wheel of chasing success. And I tell you this story to say, when I achieved all of my dreams, my successes, I felt just like Joe in this movie, Soul, being like, wow, I thought I'd feel different. And when I was at that rock bottom of this numbing depression with sleepless nights of just what am I doing with my life? That's when ayahuasca came into my field and it was undeniable. One of my good friends had mentioned she had just done ayahuasca and like that, I would have never known she even knew about ayahuasca. And it's, there was, I don't know, this is five years ago. I wrote in my book, Soul Life Balance. I've talked about it at length, but at the time, right now, just in real time, being truthful with you guys, I don't remember all the other synchronicities, but it was like just in my face from every direction. And that's what I call being called by the medicine. You know, it was undeniable that it was time to sit with ayahuasca. And I think what I really want to get clear on for those of you curious about working with Bufo or any other medicine is, is it coming from your mind or is it coming from your heart? You know, I feel like we can look at the archetypal energies of yin and yang or yang, and we can see that the yang or yang, the lighter side of the symbol is about outward expression. It's about how we show up in the world. It's how we move through the world with our five senses. It's our responsibilities, obligations. It's the human doing. Whereas the yin is the dark side of the symbol. And it's about the inner world of thoughts and feelings, receptivity, intuition, and our innate human being. It's a connection to our soul. So I think of this in my two books ago was called Soul Life Balance. And I do offer keynotes on uh, Soul Life Balance, where it's a reframe of work-life balance, where soul is equated to the yin and life is equated to the yang. And to me, it's like, no wonder why we're facing this mental health crisis, because work-life balance is double yang, right? Where's the time for our inner world of that yin energy? So since I am so passionate about like the symbol of yin yang and this me message of soul life balance, I almost look at everything I do being like, okay, am I balanced with the masculine and the feminine, the feminine being yin and yang being the masculine. Meaning that if I am approaching a medicine ceremony in my yang energy, which would be my head, which would be the masculine and like almost approaching it like I would a vacation, like I'm comparing prices online, I'm looking at hotels, I'm looking at flights. If it's a plant medicine ceremony, I'm like Googling Bufo facilitator near me. Like if you find yourself doing something like that, fam, you're not being called. You're straight, you're in your head, which is okay. I mean, that's totally okay. And I think if you're at rock bottom, that, that definitely would make more sense. For me though, what works for me and many people I know is working with your heart, tapping into that yin energy where it's uh, the femininity, it's the receptivity, it's your intuition, which is like, wow, this is all just coming into my field and okay, uh, I'm being called. Now, this is where we can call upon discernment. And discernment is more of a masculine quality. Again, going back to yin yang or soul life balance, we can see that like when it comes to medicine ceremonies, if I were to be in my masculine and put a percentage on it, I would say let 60 to 70, maybe even 80% of being called be the feminine, the yin energy, but still have some masculine energy there, which is discernment. Okay, let me do my due diligence to vet this facilitator, to do some more research. Oh, do I have enough time to integrate on the other side? Do I actually know what this medicine is about? Do I know the use cases? Do Let me do some research, right? And I say to vet the facilitator, because this is the wild west right now. There are so many people that do a medicine once and they're like, okay, I'm going to be a facilitator now. Or they go through like one online training course, or online keyword there about how to be a facilitator, even an online course of how to be a shaman. Fan, I'm, I'm not joking. This is real stuff. Like literally you could do an online course on how to be a medicine facilitator or worse, even a shaman. And I don't say worse. I don't mean like judgment there, but I mean like, that this is all great stuff to learn, but doing one online course about how to facilitate plant and earth medicines or psychedelics, I'm sorry, but like 
that does not give you the right to start facilitating psychedelics. I think there's a lot of mes mentorship needed and real life experience in being in the ceremony space. That is my personal opinion. And I've seen plenty of people get traumatized or quote unquote traumatized uh, from working with facilitators that are out of integrity and are doing it, whether it's for profits or to feed their own ego, because it's very easy for a facilitator to be in integrity, meaning that they aren't doing it to make money, but they're doing it to like to help other people. But what happens is they start to get this spiritual narcissist uh, type qualities coming up where it's like uh, all these people are starting to feel grateful for like, oh my God, you're amazing. Like, thank you so much for facilitating this medicine ceremony. And they start to look at the facilitator as if the facilitator did the work and some fac facilitators let that go to their head. And then now they can no longer be a clear vessel and a clear channel to hold space for the facilitation of the medicine themselves, which now brings them out of integrity. There are so many nuances to plant and earth medicine. That is just like a quick little rabbit hole. I wrote a book in 2023. It's a workbook. It's called Psychedelic Compass. Uh, and in that book, it's really like a workbook. I talk about the most common type of plant and earth medicines and provide a ton of journaling prompts. I get deep into the wild west of the space as well. So if you want to check it out, I keep the price pretty low on Amazon. So it's affordable so you can buy it and discern which and if plant and earth medicines would be a good fit for you. You can find the link to Psychedelic Compass in the show notes of this podcast. So getting back on track here, we've talked about intuition. We've talked about discernment. We've talked about a little bit vetting plant and earth medicine facilitators. We've talked about the differences between NNDMT and 5-MeO DMT. Now let's talk about the toad itself. So the toad is the Bufal various toads, Snorn Desert Toad, Colorado River Toad. There's a few other names floating around as well. Basically, this toad can be found in parts of Arizona and parts of Mexico in the Sonoran Desert. And it's said to live about 10 or so months of its life underground. And then it comes out of hibernating in the rainy season, which is around July. And when the toad comes out, its cheeks are puffed up and it has this venom, which is where the 5-MeO can be extracted from. And basically, you would just like squeeze and pop it in the cheek like it's a pimple and the pus would come out that's the venom and it would be left on a sheet of glass to crystallize then it's actually smoked that's how it's inhaled this isn't family guy and licking toads by the way so when i say all of this you might be thinking huh interesting well is that safe is it safe and that brings up a whole nother discussion because there is a lot of harm being done to the toads. There's a lot of research around this. And this is another reason why it's very important to vet your facilitators. I've uh, encountered people that have pet toads or maybe have a toad, quote unquote, sanctuary. I remember being at a crystal shop in Sedona and talking with a worker there that was kind of like, laughing about how he's got a bunch of bufo toads and kind of like bragging about it and i mean again i'm, I'm one of the things i work with is judgment so i don't want to uh, come across as judgmental because i am working to release more and more judgment but this also is about discernment as well and knowing what is in integrity of your own morals and values and maybe not so much judging someone else but like that goes against my own integrity um, I think it's very important to vet your facilitators, ask them about the sourcing of the medicine, because not only is that, in my opinion, like the right thing to do, but also you should be mindful of your own energy, because if the toad is experiencing trauma when that medicine is being extracted from an energetic level, that's getting passed on to you. And obviously from like morals and ethics and values and integrity and like doing the right thing, we want the toads to be able, be able to defend themselves. Now, from what I understand that people 
source the medicine ethically, they work with the toads to just do one cheek and they make sure that it doesn't have enough or make sure that it has enough to actually protect itself. There's a lot more that can go into it as well. And I'm not a facilitator, so that's not uh, something that I feel comfortable speaking on myself. Point being that that's how the medicine comes and it's worth talking with your facilitator about it. Now, the legend that I heard about how they found out about this, because I mean, what's probably percolating in your mind is like, how they even discover this? That's so random, right? And it's almost like a cosmic joke that's in the toad that's underground most of its life. Well, the tribe that is the Siri tribe in the Sonoran Desert, and this is the legend that I've heard from multiple sources, it said that the star people told them, meaning that we can think of the star people people is obviously ETs, extraterrestrials or aliens, uh, told them. And that is how they found out about this. Whether that's a story that resonates with you or not, that's, that's what's out there. So, all right, now that we understand the source comes from the toad, why would someone actually want to sit with 5-MeO DMT? Well, from what I've seen from the hundreds and hundreds of people that I've worked with, a lot of people, it starts with curiosity. And other people, it starts with healing from PTSD, trauma, right? And what's very fascinating from looking at an experience with Bufo as opposed to, say, an experience with ayahuasca or even mushrooms is that in an ayahuasca ceremony, and I'm speaking from my own experience and what I've heard from other people as well. So it's not just what I've experienced in ayahuasca, but you have to relive that trauma. And you've relived that trauma and that experience from so many different angles until you accept it. That is to say, until you surrender to it. Now, Bufo, because it's not so much of a visual and interactive experience, it's more of a felt experience. And I'll talk about the ego going offline in just a second here. The difference is when the ego goes offline, the body is free to release because the body doesn't just hold energy and stored emotions, which those emotions, emotion, the root word of it is energy in motion. If you don't allow the energy to be in motion, that energy gets trapped in the body. This is somatics, right? It, same thing goes for trauma. If you don't allow yourself to feel the trauma, that gets uh, stored in the body. So when the ego goes offline in the Bufo ceremony, the body is free to express itself and to re release that stored energy. So you don't necessarily have to relive the traumatic experience. And a lot of people will gravitate towards Bufo as opposed to something like ayahuasca for that reason alone. And that's not to say this is going to be a case for everyone. Like understand like this isn't an objective thing that we're talking here. So anytime you hear me or anyone else saying anything about this, know that there is a certain level of subjectivity to it. So when I'm saying something that is a general generalization, please understand that it's just that. It's a generalization. It's not a concrete fact being like it's going to be this way for you. Now, having said that, we, we talked about different reasons why people would want to sit with the toad. The biggest is really trauma is what I see. There's... Um, breaking habits and behaviors, even addiction. That's another one too. In my book that I just referenced recently in Psychedelic Compass, I talk about the different use cases or reasons why you might sit with mushrooms or ayahuasca or bufo or iboga or even ibogaine and a combo, cambo, a peyote, or uh, you know all these different medicines, the peyote representing like the mescaline category of the cacti. But that said, most generally, like th there's nuances. There's like these subtle nuances for most of these medicines. And for me, the biggest one that I see with Bufo versus another medicine is because the ego goes offline. So let's talk about the ceremony itself. The ceremonies that I've experienced are generally about an hour and a half to maybe two hours long. And it's a one-on-one -on -one setting, meaning that it's the facilitator and you, unless you want any loved ones there for you, 
uh, holding space or staying with the medicine as well, along with one to two assistants for the facilitator. So maybe not like technically <laughs> one on one, but it's pretty much one on one. The assistant's job are basically to do just that, to assist the facilitator so that the facilitator can focus on you, so that they can focus on facilitating the experience and the assistants are there to hold space, be another energy to hold that space. And it's all about your safety. Your safety is the utmost important because this is where set and setting comes in meaning your intention and the environment that you are in. We want you to feel safe. Now, if you've seen the recent uh, reboot or fourth Matrix movie, it's called Matrix Resurrections. I think it came out in 2022 or something like that. So it's been out a few years at the time of this recording. So hopefully you've seen it. But either way, there's a scene there where they're extracting Neo from the matrix because he finds himself back in the matrix and the first time they tried to extract him this setting the environment wasn't really the best fit so then they tried to extract him again and try to wake him up and give him an opportunity to take the red pill so what they did is they uh, adjusted the set and setting to make it like the first time they extracted him in the original matrix and what i loved about the movie was they even referenced set and setting being like oh the nostalgia of something that where you feel safe we figured like this would be a better setting and that's just a nod to plant and earth medicines and how that movie is so similar to like a earth medicine awakening or plant medicine right awakening to you're so much greater than being this body in this matrix not to disassociate from it but yeah, that's that's a great example of set and setting right there. So you come to your ceremony space. It's all about your safety, set and setting. Facilitators, in my ex experience, will typically talk with you to kind of get a sense of where you're at. Typically, they will have already met you. That is in communication, either on a phone call, Zoom call, a call, text messages, whatever it is. So you guys had a chance to connect. But in the connection in real time, we all know like in connection in real time is so important. And also like, hey, where are you at right now? So that's all about like set and setting safety and getting you mentally prepared. When it comes to actually smoking the medicine, it is about a 10 second, maybe 15 second inhale. And for me, I am a breathwork practitioner. And I think part of my fascination with the breath is having trouble breathing myself to be just transparent and open with you guys. My first time, maybe even my first couple, but I think my first time several years back doing Bufo, it was hard for me to inhale. And not because the the smoke is harsh because it's really not. It's it's so subtle. Like if you've smoked anything in your life, like bong loads back in the day or anything like that, then you'll know like how harsh uh, smoking can be. If you've smoked NN DMT, you know how harsh that is. The Bufo experience typically when inhaling is a very smooth inhale, but you do need to be able to inhale for 10 to 15 seconds and a lot of nerves can come up. What helped me was practicing with a vape pen of, I think it was just like essential oils. And feel free to reach out to me if you need more support on this, but just find a vape pen that's not tobacco, it's not THC, it's just like essentially essential oils. And you can practice with that. And what I did with that pen was do breath work with it to practice just my inhale and inhaling up like versus just doing breath work on my own actually inhaling something and i found that that like essential oil type vape pen was about as smooth as the actual bufo experience so that's helpful and as you start and please know as well everyone that what i'm talking about here are considered to be threshold doses there are some facilitators that serve bufo and do lighter doses where the ego doesn't go offline that's not what i'm talking about everything right now what i'm talking about is considered to be a threshold or reset uh, type journey so as you are inhaling the medicine 10 to 15 seconds this is typically 
when you start to dissolve into the abyss, into the nothingness. And I like to say it's like a snap, a snap of the fingers where like the ego just goes offline and there might be an assistant there to help lie you down on a pillow or if you're standing up to help lay you down on the mat. And at this point in time, most people are just gone. And this is what it means to be off line when the ego goes offline and i'm using a lot of big terms here so let's break them down first thing back in the day when i first got on this path and i heard words like ego it really threw me off i didn't understand what the ego was because i was so indoctrinated by ego in terms of like narcissists or full of yourself the ego as i think of it now in terms of a spiritual meaning is the identification of self meaning that we all have souls, right? And our soul is tied to this human body. For me, I am a man. I, at the time of this recording, I'm 36 years old, and my name is Sam, and I live in Santa Cruz, California. These variables of who I am is who I chose to incarnate as in this current lifetime. That is my ego identification of self. That has nothing to do with my self-confidence or my overconfidence, narcissism, or anything like that. So please understand, when we hear the word ego, what we're referring to is the identification of self. This includes your characteristics, personality traits, and these sorts of things. Going offline, let's define this one. So there's the so-called default mode network in the brain. And what happens with Bufo is the default mode network gets turned off. And this is where you're able to create new neural pathways for new neural networks, meaning that if there is, say, an addiction or a story of a limiting belief or anything at all that is blocking you, it's in this time of the ego going off where new neural pathways can form new neural networks to break these loops. So with all of this said, the best analogy that was taught to me that I think really paints a good picture is imagine you are getting a new update on your phone, specifically for iPhones. I'm an iPhone user. I assume it works the same with Droid or anything else, but the screen would turn black, right? When you do that software upgrade, well, that black where it's just darkness and there's nothing there, that's the ego when it goes offline. And in that time, that's when new neural networks are being formed. That's when you're breaking loops. That's when the body, the nervous system is doing its thing, right? Or we could look at the phone upgrade where it's doing its thing behind the scenes. And then it slowly comes back. And with the iPhones, there's that bar and it slowly loads up right? You can see a little bit of white until it expands all the way. I like to think of this two ways. Either one, this is the time in your experience when you start to land back into your body and you see you have fingers, you start to re-identify with your ego. You start to notice the room, the facilitators, you're slowly coming back into your body. Or, and or, you can think of this over the next few days, months of new software being updated because that's a new thing and that's a thing as well. So with all of this, one of the main reasons why we would want to do this reset is because it very much does feel like a rebirth. It is the opportunity to relieve those energies that are stored and stuck in, those bo in the body, as well as traumas, as well as addictions, as well as habits and behaviors. I had someone, a client of mine, who said that she, I forget how many drinks she had, but I think she was drinking like this for years, like seven drinks a night, every single day of the week. And I checked in with her several times over the next few weeks, month, and then over the next several months as well. And she stopped drinking completely. And she didn't even come into the ceremony with the intention of to stop drinking, but it just happened. She was no longer interested in drinking. And stories like this, whether it's cannabis or anything else as well, where you may not have had this intention of like quitting or stopping something, but then in the integration, it's just like, oh, 
I don't need that anymore. Because on a subconscious level, so often with these habits and behaviors that, or addictions that aren't serving us, it's to fulfill an internal void. And how we come out on the other, how we can come out on the other side of a medicine ceremony is realizing we don't need anything outside of ourselves to fulfill us. We are whole and complete just as we are. Now, some expectations here, right? Because expectations are important to a certain degree. First things first, I am not promising you that if you sit with Bufo or any other medicine that it's going to make your life better. I'll say that again. I am not promising you that your life is going to get better after sitting with any of these medicines. I think that is very important. Someone might tell you that, oh, it's all love, it's all bliss, it's the feeling that you are God and it's just so beautiful and it's happy and it's amazing. And maybe that's all you heard and you had an experience and you came out of it, oh my God, that was so dark, that was so traumatizing. Understand that everyone is going to have a different experience. And we are not chasing experiences. It, to go back to feeling called to the medicine, if you're coming to this experience because you want to feel what God feels like and that's what you, you're expecting to feel, then you may be in for a rude awakening. Any expectations of what you think or feel should happen in your ceremony, straight up, you need to let that go. You need to let that go. You, you can put an intention out there but we can't have expectations of what's going to happen. Now, in the integration with Bufo specifically, over the next few days, weeks, months, and the rest of your life, things are going to unfold like things can, um, language, right, y'all? Things can unfold that are just mind-blowing. While with mushrooms or ayahuasca, uh, personally, I feel like I get a roadmap in my ceremony where it's like, okay, do this different, do that different, okay, but, 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 but. I, I see the areas I need to change in my life. Let me take the next few days, weeks after my ceremony to sit with those changes. Let me use some discernment and combine that with my intuition then be like, okay, I'm going to start to integrate, take action, make changes, positive changes in my life. Awesome. Go me. Did awesome. I feel great. Life's so much better, right? With Bufo, for a lot of people, it doesn't work that way. For a lot of people, you may get a few downloads. You may get a few messages in the coming back of your ceremony. But a lot of the experience is just like WTF. Like, okay, now what? Like, there's nothing that I or anyone else can say to truly prepare you for this experience. I mean, uh, come on. I'm saying like, this is the felt experience that you, yes, you are God creating your reality. I am a reflection. I am a mirror of you delivering this message to you because this is the message that you need to hear. But we're all one. The mind can't necessarily conceptualize that. And even in Bufo, the mind can't really understand that, but we can feel that. And once we feel that, we have what's called gnosis. We have this felt and lived experience of something that we previously only intellectually knew. Now, with this gnosis, what are we supposed to do with that, right? Because so often in Bufo ceremonies, we don't get that clear message of how to integrate it or take action. And that's why it's so important next few days, months, et cetera, of your experience, you find stillness. Stillness is one of the best things that you can do to integrate any medicine experience, but especially in Bufo. It's within the stillness and the silence that the messages start to come through. So get out in nature, journal, breath work, meditation, go on bike rides, go on walks. One of the most profound things for me was just simply getting curious and just using my curiosity being like, well, why don't I go, like literally this sounds silly, but why don't I go down this path instead of the normal path that I go down? And when I say path, I mean like turn uh, when I'm walking or driving my car or on my bike or something like something that small where it's like you're always on sub uh subconscious autopilot and you just normally do this the same thing all the time it's like well let me just get curious because it's these small changes where you do something a little bit differently where you start to see the messages unfold for me after an experience with the toad 
it very much feels like waking up within the dream. I feel synchronicities to increase. And I like to think of synchronicities as many miracles. God winks. One of my coaches, Kyle Kingsbury, said once, and I thought this was just profound. It's that synchronicities are happening all the time. We only call them synchronicities when they're so obvious to us. And what happens with Bufo is it's not that we're experiencing more God winks, many miracles, uh, synchronicities. It's that we're more open to receiving them because our vibration, our frequency is higher now. So, and we are slowing down so we can see, feel, and experience them. Bashar, an amazing channel of Daryl Anka, or Daryl Anka is the channel of Bashar. Not sure which way to say it there. Either way, I'll move on. Uh, Bashar says that we all have a core vibrational frequency, and it's our conditioning and our programming that keeps us away from that core high vibrational frequency. Bufo is that core high vibrational frequency. So, yeah, you're going to be operating on a higher state. All this to say, if you experience uh, sleepless nights, anxiety, depression, severe grief, anger, uh, really any um, uh, story, emotion, anything at all, know that it's completely normal. Typically what's going on there is it's suppressed and repressed emotions that you, you typically have where they're starting to build up because they want to be released. And it's so much easier for me to say this than for me to... Uh, like it's just easy to say, but it's hard to understand or it's hard to accept, I guess. Uh, but the only way out is within. Shout out to my buddy, Nathan Kohlerman. He reframed the only way out is through to the only way out is within. And I just love that because I've always loved the only way out is through. But it's true that like it's as Nathan's reframe alludes to the way out is within. It's not about like, oh, let me get past this because there's still like that masculine energy almost of resistance. It's like, no, the way out is within, meaning acceptance and surrender. So that gets me to victim mentality. And I'm by no meaning uh, shaming you if you feel that you have victim mentality. I want you to know that up till about the age of 18, I suffered from extreme victim mentality. So it's so easy for me to get back in that vibrational state of that glass is half empty and poor me, woe is me. Um, I think this would be a shock for those of you that know me because many people see me as an inspiration motivation. Um, I am a motivational speaker as well. And I think part of me being that bright light is because I've had to work through the victim mentality of the glasses half, half empty, uh, as opposed to half full and just seeing everything as a problem and, um, know that if you are struggling with your integration in any medicine, then you may, I'm strongly using the word may here be experiencing some victim mentality. And some things you can do are simple reframes, and it is a cliche, but I'm going to say anyways, this is happening for me, not to me. Now, what, what works for me when I'm sitting in the dark night of the soul, which can be in, uh, referred to as like extreme victim mentality of not being able to find a positive light and just going through the darkness, what works for me best is adopting a game time mindset getting excited being like okay so if i'm doing all this work like literally doing plant medicine work and integrating with learning about spiritual and self-development spiritual development lessons themes tools all of that if i'm if i'm learning all of this then then I should put it to use, right? Like, oh shoot, now that things are tough, they're hard, they're sticky, instead of being like, oh, poor me, it's like, no, let me call upon all those tools and those experiences and resources and now utilize them to help me go within, to accept and surrender because the way out is within, to quote Nathan Kohlerman. So that's what I have for you in terms of expectations. We're getting close to wrapping this up. I did take some notes and I didn't look at any of my notes. So I'm just going to check in with my notes here real quick to make sure that I am telling you guys everything that I want to tell you. Um, 
there is one thing I didn't mention. Wow, I covered pretty much all of it. So your thoughts and feelings create your reality. See others as a version of yourself, increase joy and fulfillment. One of the, the spiritual teachers that has helped me in understanding Bufo so much is Neville Goddard. He's a spiritual teacher from the early to mid 1900s. There is a now friend of mine. He's been on the podcast. I reached out to him after listening to his book. His name's Tim Grimes, and he's written a bunch of book in which he repurposes Neville Goddard's work. And one of my favorite books by Tim Grimes is called Relax More, Try Less. And it's exactly that. It's about relaxing and surrendering, surrendering to the feelings of relaxation and trying less to receive more. Neville Goddard's got an amazing book calling called Feeling is the Secret. He's got so much amazing work. And it's very similar to Dr. Joe Dispenza's work. One of my favorite Dr. Joe quotes is, your personality creates your personal reality. What I want you guys to understand about the subconscious mind is that the subconscious mind makes up 95% uh, of your awareness, meaning 95% of your awareness you don't have access to. We only have access to 5% of our conscious awareness. So this is almost where like uh, the Swiss psychiatrist Carl Jung's work comes in. How do we make the unconscious or subconscious conscious? And this is why I like Dr. Joe's work and why I like uh, Neville Goddard's work so much because they talk about how to make the subconscious or unconscious conscious. And it truly is like that our thoughts and feelings are creating our reality. So the question becomes, okay, how do we get extremely clear on what our thoughts and feelings are? Now, I will say most people don't talk about the dark side or negative side and manifestation. When we are spiraling down a negative mindset that is victim mentality, we can call it, then we are going to be experiencing more of it, especially after Bufo, because in Bufo, we are manifesting at a faster rate. So if we're not careful and we're letting our thoughts and feelings dictate our inner world, then that gets reflected in our outer world. Quantum physics, right? As above, so below. Your outer world is a reflection of your inner world. So here's what you can do to help become a co-creator of your life. I call it the six step breath process. And breath is an acronym. And it goes like this. The B in breath is breathe to slow down. The R is relax to feel. The E is energy to reveal. The A is accept to surrender. The T is transform into empowering beliefs. And the H is habits to integrate. Now, I, I understand that's a lot. I literally wrote a whole book about this. So yeah, it's a lot. For that reason, knowing that it is a lot, I broke it down into three simple themes. First, breathe, then feel, then think intentionally. So it'll look like this. At any point in your day, you may experience a trigger. And not to necessarily define trigger, let's just understand that a trigger is something that is keeping us from the present moment. Now we are either in the past ruminating on an event, memory, trauma, experience, whatever, or we are in the future, which can bring about anxiety and worry and all that. So when you experience this trigger, you have a choice because we always have a choice. You can either react or you can respond. And when I say react, I mean react as in numbing, distracting, disassociating, and really just just reacting to something as opposed to feeling it, allowing for it to be there, which is to respond. One way you can respond to a trigger is through the six step breath process, which is as simple as breathing, feeling, and thinking intentionally. So basically something happens, right? Like, and all of a sudden now you feel this trigger. If you're anything like me, your, your vice that you use to numb and distract is food. I will walk myself over to the cupboard, get a big old bag of pistachios, hover over the trash can, and I'm cracking open, cracking these pistachios 
pistachios open, throwing the pistachio in my mouth and tossing the shell in the trash. And I find like this little, little rhythm of crack, throw, toss, crack, throw, toss, right? And after a few minutes, I'll think to myself, what am I doing here? Like, what, what is going on? What am I distracting myself from feeling? And it's in that awareness that I have the opportunity to either continue to react to that trigger point or I can respond. And when I respond, the first thing I'm going to do is put that bag away, right? Or maybe it's scrolling on your phone for social media or your emails or whatever your vice is. As soon as you have that conscious awareness of, oh, I'm doing something to avoid feeling, now you have the opportunity to respond. The first thing you can do, breathe. Slow down through breathing. Regulate your nervous system and start to shift into rest and digest. The slower you breathe, focusing on a long game, the exhales, the more restful you'll get. And in this breathing to slow down, you'll begin to feel. And as you feel, understand that emotions are energy in motion. In fact, in 2008, Dr. Jill Bolte-Taylor delivered a brilliant TED Talk in which she told us about the 90-second rule. And the 90-second rule teaches us that we have a 90-second physiological response when we experience an emotion. And remember that emotions are energy in motion. So in this second theme, as we're starting to slow down, allow yourself to feel all of the emotions that come through. In the six-step breath process, this is steps three and four. Energy to reveal and accept to surrender. Ask yourself, what is this energy revealing to me? Is there a story here? And as you ask these questions, what the energy is here to reveal, understand that you may have some resistance, which is why you can come back to your breath to use it like an anchor so that you can accept and surrender to the lesson coming through. As you continue to breathe and you feel, when you finally get to a point of feeling settled, like, oh, okay, all right, I feel good again. We're not done yet. Now, because you have gone through those denser and heavier emotions and you have sat, accepted, and surrendered to them and processed them, you have earned the right to utilize the power of positive thinking. And I say earn the right intentionally because there is a toxic positivity culture that is going all throughout the world where it's like, just feel good, just feel good and think good vibes and don't allow negativity to come in. That is like the worst advice because by not allowing yourself to feel those negative emotions, those energies get stored in the body, then we're just going to have to do more plant medicine ceremonies to get rid of that energy or breath work journeys or whatever else. So instead, remember the 90 second rule. We can process these emotions in less than 90 seconds if we allow ourselves to feel them. So after going through processing these emotions, you've earned the right to apply positive thinking. And you must leave this experience on a positive note of thinking intentionally because neuroscience teaches us that we have over 60,000 thoughts a day. Now, 80% of those thoughts are from the day before. And the real kicker is that 90% of those thoughts are negative. So if you find yourself in a victim mentality or anything at all that's more of a negative frequency, instead of getting caught in guilt and shame and all this negative self-chat, understand like, no, this is normal. Most people have 90% negative thoughts and they're from the day before. That's why this is a practice of coming back to the positive thinking after we process our emotions. So again, to be more present moment to moment and to become a creator of your reality, there are three simple themes to employ. The first is to breathe then feel, and finally think intentionally. By practicing these three themes from the six step breath process, you can start to become more present in the moment and create the reality that you wish to live in. Literally, this stuff works. So I have a brand new book called Overcome the Overwhelm, where I walk you through all the six steps. You can find the link in the show notes if you're curious uh, to go deeper on that. To wrap all this up, I mentioned that earlier that one of my favorite movies is this movie called Soul. 
with our friend Joe Gardner, who realized his ultimate dream, right? He had this beautiful jazz gig that was like his ultimate perceived potential. And he reached that only to feel more, let's just call it disappointed after the experience, right? So by the end of the movie, this is after he achieved his dream, he was asked a simple question. Well, may, may, maybe it wasn't so simple, but I'll let you be the judge of that. The question was, how are you going to live the rest of your life? And Joe responded by saying, I'm not sure, but I do know I'm going to live every minute of it. And so I ask you, how are you going to live every minute of your life? Thank you so much. If you want to learn more about Bufo or my integration coaching, my keynote speaking or anything at all, feel free to reach out to me. I offer free one-on-one -on -one chats, a complimentary, I should say. To my, my whole thing is to help other people realize that they don't need a coach. They don't need a guide. You know, obviously with plant and earth medicines, you do need a guide, but in terms of integration, like you don't need me or anyone else. All the answers are inside you. But if you need some help in finding ways to get to those answers, please feel free to reach out. I also have a YouTube series called Spirituality Simplified. And on that YouTube series, there is a playlist called Bufo. And I will link that in the show notes here. It is a seven-part series that can help you to integrate uh, your Bufo experience into everyday life. There's a few visualizations, breathwork techniques, meditations, things like that. So anything you need at all i have free resources i have several books and everything else and i'm happy to point you in the right direction this is what fills up my soul and feeds my soul and keeps me it really helps with my own mental health so i appreciate you i love you thank you for checking out this pod feel free to share it with anyone you know that would benefit from it and please subscribe rate and review this podcast if you are new or you haven't yet it helps the show grow my whole intention with the Soul Seeker podcast is to help raise the collective consciousness from this fallen state. So if you're down with that mission, please consider giving back to the show. It's free. Just subscribe, rate, and review. Thank you so much. And I'll see you on the next episode of the Soul Seeker podcast.